I'll be reading the book of John, 135 to 46. Can you please stand up for the reading of God's word? The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what, what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew said, ah, sorry, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. <clears throat> the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip, from the, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked, come and see, said Philip. You may be seated. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> good morning. You guys ready for the word? Man, you guys are in a good mood this morning. What happened? <laughs> what happened? The Lord, okay, that's a good answer. Hey, we are finishing up our series um, this Sunday. We've been in the series called Lead. Uh, I'm not going to walk through all the steps, but what we've been talking about is about the ways in which people can begin to grow wherever you're at in your faith here at Redeemers, and it's in your bulletin, but it's about these step-by-step -step processes that all start and always starts and always continues to start uh, at, am I sitting at the feet of Jesus? Am I drawing near to him? Am I answering his call to follow? Right? We've talked about discipleship, how that is some, a word we throw around in church, but what does that look like? Are we doing it? Because that has been our call. If you know Jesus, if you don't, that's what he's calling you into. And so I encourage you to look at that, to look again, once again, at our bulletin where it talks about the steps of growth and figuring out where are you at, what is God wanting to do in your life right now, wherever you're at, whether you're a non-believer, a new believer, uh, whether you're an old believer and getting older, you know, um, <laughs> Where does God want to begin with you right now? But as we close this series, um, what, we, what this has really been about this whole time is it's an invitation. It's been an invitation to come join in what God is doing now in this city, in this church, in your families, in your lives. Like It's an invitation to say, God, I'm going to begin to make things more serious about learning about you, about asking the hard questions. It's been an invitation to grow closer to Jesus. It's an invitation to become disciples the way he taught us to be, not the way we would like it to be. It's an invitation to become part of, to become the church that God desires of us. And not just settle for the way church has always been done. It's an invitation to be part of a greater mission. Something that takes our whole lives, that gives us a different purpose and meaning. And that's what we're talking about as we look at the text we read today. I encourage you, you can even have your Bibles open and, and continue to read through this text because it's all about how Jesus invites his disciples. And if you and I are going to begin to really answer that, i got to tell you, you, can be, you, it's very easy today to go, hey, I'm already a, a, a Christian of some sort, I'm already a Christ follower, and ignore this. But the thing is, is what is he really calling us to? Is that, have we just raised our hand and said, I believe in Jesus, or... Are we actually living out the call on our life, the mission on our life? So if you are here because you're a Christ follower, that means you have committed to become a disciple. The rave is about to start, y'all. I feel like I should do a poem right now. If you are here because you're a Christ follower... Here we go, I told you. 
All right, I don't know. We got issues. I make it super spiritual. The devil don't want to hear the word this morning. Does that work? <laughs> All right. <laughs> if you're here because you are a Christ follower, that means you've committed to be a disciple. So that means we've got to look at this text and go, what is he then saying to me now through that? But if you are here and you're not sure if you're a Christ follower, cool, awesome, great to have you. But if you're just searching, then you need to hear what this is about because what Jesus does from the beginning is he says, come and follow me. And he talks about what that looks like. And that's where we begin to see answers. So if you listen to Jesus as he told his disciples in John 15, he actually tells them something that's really important for us. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear much fruit. I appointed you. I've given you a mission to go produce goodness for the world, for those around you. I appointed you. I've chosen you. So often we think, well, I chose to be this or that. I'm choose. No, God has chosen you. You may have made a choice at some point, but somebody has reached out to you. Some epiphany of knowledge has been given to you. Some experience where God has called you and met you where you were broken has led you here. God has chose you by name, and I hope you believe that. Amen? Perhaps you came to this church because somebody invited you. Anybody? Raise your hand if you were invited here. All right? Perhaps you're a Christian because your parents were Christians. We'll work on that. <laughs> but at some point, my point is, even if, you're Christian, even if you're Christian because your parents were, yeah, we got to grow in our own way with God, but you still were invited in. But maybe they were invited in at some point as well. I know that's true in my family. Perhaps you came here because you had a nudging on your heart from God himself. You know, I, I, I've told you my story. I was driving down the street, and I, and I don't usually say weird things like this, but I literally had a sense from God that he said to walk into that church and see if they needed a pastor. Right? There was a nudging. I've actually heard somebody say, I had the same thing driving by. God told me to walk in this day. And that was exactly what they needed to hear. I don't know how you got here, how you became a believer, how you came to this uh, church today. But perhaps you came here because you had that nudging or a friend or a family. Whatever it might be, what I'm telling you is God does not make mistakes. God orchestrates it. God orchestrates where you're at, even in hard times. I can tell you, I have been through incredibly difficult things recently, and God is orchestrating those. He doesn't cause them, but he sure knows how to use them if you're willing to lean into them. You were not created purposeless, and so when we look at our text today, the scripture tells us that that he knew each and every one of us. He knew us by name. He's calling his disciples by name. Other parts of scripture tells us that he, he knows that who we were in the womb. You understand that? In the book of John, Jesus says that he knows his sheep by name and they know his voice. Like it is this constant thing, understanding that God already knew your mess. He already knew your problems. He already knew who you were going to be. He knew your greatness. He knew your strengths. He fashioned you. He knows you by name and he has been inviting you in. Sometimes we don't listen. Sometimes we don't have ears to hear. Sometimes we just don't want to go. Right? Anybody been invited to a party you didn't want to go to? Well, someone's not going to be there. When we look at our reading today, we see that the first call of Jesus' disciples... And, and I think it is so important for us because as we continue to talk about ways in which we are going, going to grow in our faith and not rest in just saying a, that I am a Christian, but really growing into what Christ's likeness is, and if we're going to grow in our whole lives and in our purpose, then we have to examine what the response of Jesus' first disciples was and what does that mean for us. What was it when, they, when he first called them? The first thing we read in this text is that there's John the Baptist, who's already this great leader for God, and he's got disciples, people following him to learn from him. But then he knows Jesus is there, and he goes, you need to go follow him. Like He's like, I know I'm your teacher at this point, but it's now the real Messiah, the guy I'm pointing to is here. You need to go fall in step with him and be led by him. So his followers go and go after Jesus, and when they see Jesus 
Jesus invites them in as well. So John invites them to go after him. Jesus invites them in. And then as soon as Jesus invites them to come hang out with him and experience having dinner and being with him, the first thing it says Andrew did, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. You've got to come too. Come and see. You see it? John the Baptist invited them to go. Jesus invited them to go. The minute they experienced, they said, I got to go tell some other people about this. The first thing they did was to invite people they knew. You got to come meet this guy. So if you're following, the invite carries on and carries forward. And Jesus calls Simon by name to come follow him. And then he says, Simon, your name is no longer Simon. It's Cephas, meaning Peter. It means the rock. And later on in scripture, he says, on this rock, I'm going to build the foundations of my church. And what is so important about this is, yes, he knows your name, but he already knows what he has purposed you for. So when he calls you and you say yes, he goes, I'm giving you a new vocation. I'm giving you a new mission. Not only are you going to, you're not doing what you used to do, now you are going to be the rock in which I build my church. You have a new identity, a new purpose in life if you follow me. Later, Jesus tells him, well, sorry, Jesus was not only calling him by name, he was changing his very trajectory of his life. And I want you to wrestle with that. You don't have to say anything, but when you became a Christian, did it change the way you saw your purpose in the world? Did it change the way you do mission week in and week out, the way you live out your life for others? Because that's what he's calling you to. What is so encouraging here is that if we are following Christ, you can stand in confidence knowing that he knows your name and has intentionally chosen you and appointed you to go and do what he has asked on his mission, and it is going to be fruitful because you're doing it with him. Jesus saw something in them and sees something in you even when you can't see it. Some of you are sitting here and, and you're going, I'm jacked up. I am not, this is not my thing. And I'm like, you're right. So am I. Jesus sees in you already what you are and what you could be, and he knows how he's going to lead you if you give yourself to following. So today we're going to look at the many ways Jesus invites us in to join him, who he invites in, which is incredibly important, and why he invites us in, okay? So he, Jesus invites us to join him, and we're going to talk about who he invites in and why he invites us in. The first thing we hear him say in this text is, come and see. Jesus is consistently inviting those looking for answers to come and learn from him. So when you see these disciples, the first thing they ask is, where are you staying? But as like talking to your wife, you always got to look at the question beyond the question, right? There's something deeper underlining, subconscious there, right? What are they really saying? <laughs> the, the answer here is not simply, I want to know, well, you know what hotel you're staying at. It's, I want to know where you're going. Are you really the Messiah? This is their interest. They've been told this is the Messiah. Who are you? What are you about? I need to know a few more details, but let's start with the shallow one first. Right? They're saying, where are you staying? And Jesus' answer wasn't like some hyper-spiritual answer. He says, come and see. Come with me. Come experience it. I'll show you. Now, I was joking because later on he tells a disciple, he, he, said, he tells a disciple, the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Foxes have holes and birds have nests. But I don't sleep anywhere. So I'm guessing these guys were surprised when they got to like a rock. He's like, this is where I'm staying. You know? Um, you know? But he invites them to come along and experience it with him. They want to know about this Messiah. But later, Philip invites Nathaniel to join him and tells him about the Messiah from Nazareth. And, Na and Philip's first question is one that we ask in many different ways, but he says it this way, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Now, Philip's super judgy. You know, what is good in Nazareth, right? But the bigger question that is like us is this, like, I don't know if I believe this garbage. Like, 
can this really be a legit thing? Like, how could somebody like this be legitimate? It's kind of like saying, why would we believe any of this stuff? Why does any of this matter? I'm not sure about this whole faith thing. And if that's you, great, because I have walked and often walked that road. I am not sure about this faith thing. Can anything good come out of this? Philip's reply isn't some super religious answer. Oh, because the Bible says so. That's how you can know. No, his reply is just come and see. Come and experience what it is like and do it with Jesus and experience the power and wisdom of of following him. Come experience it. Come see it. Come learn from him. He didn't just say, you know, because he said so. He said, if you got questions, come and see. So for those looking for answers in the room, you are not alone. For those looking for it with doubt, you are not alone. But what God says is come and see, experience. Don't just ask the question and walk away. Don't just struggle with your doubts and then don't pay attention to it. He says, come and join me. I know I've shared parts of my testimony over time, but this is a part of what it of how I became a follower of Jesus, uh, struggling through agnosticism um, into my, my 20s. I was sitting alone in a room. I've always struggled with church, never really liked it. And, um, and I'm sitting alone in the room, and I, and I look up to God with all these doubts. You know, I was in philosophy honors. Like, I just love that stuff. And I'm like, I just I doubt this crap. You know, and so I'm on my knees in this room, and I'm yelling at God, and I'm cursing at God. I'm like, I've never seen you. I've never experienced you. If you want me, come get me. But this is my last discussion about it. And, you know, the difference was is I wasn't just angry. I really meant that. I wanted to see an answer. It was a sincerity, and I believe that's what God's after. Are you sincerely looking for that answer, or are you just trying to give an excuse so you can keep doing what you're doing? You know? Because I was sincerely looking at it, but I really meant to, when I spoke to God, I really meant that this is it. This is the last time I'm talking about this. If you want me, you have to show up. And that night, I'm not going to go into it, but there was a series of miracles that grabbed my attention. If you want to know about them later, I'll share them with you. But so many weird things occurred that my little philosophical mind couldn't wrap my head around anymore. And I sat there going, okay, you've got my attention. But here was the next thing. So God said, I'm going to show you, come experience. If you come to look for me, you will find me. But then I'm like, okay, God, you've got my attention. I've seen you do some stuff that I've never seen before. But I don't know the point of church. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't like Christians. They've been awful to me. And I said, I don't get how this whole religious thing actually makes any sense, how it's good for anybody. And so I met this guy, and I'm telling him all my doubts and struggles and where I'm at. And he goes, you know what? And I asked, he lived so differently. He lived to serve the poor and the needy. And he goes, he didn't give me answers. He said, come and see. So he takes me to Skid Row, and he shows me this ministry he's doing amongst the poor and homeless and with kids who, who don't have parents uh, to guide them and support them. And, and he, his heart is pouring out for him. And I'm like, why are you doing this? And he says, come and see. And he shows me the scriptures and a thousand verses of God's heart for the needy and the rejected and those we think who aren't worth anything. And I said, that is something I want to be a part of. Come and see what God is about. Don't worry about what other people told you it was about. Come and see. Experience it. Don't worry what, but what crappy Christians told you. Come and experience what God says. See it in the word. See it in real life. See it lived out. You know? So for those sincerely looking for answers, God doesn't just give us answers. He invites you to come and walk with him and see it lived out over time as we sincerely follow and learn from him. Secondly, Jesus is also inviting you by name, saying, come and be. He is inviting all of us who are looking for relief. And this is one of the things I skip over. I'm I'm a doer. But this is such an important piece of what God says because so many of us, you are doers and you're religious by nature. So you, you move from like being a workaholic to becoming a Christian to now you're a workaholic Christian. You know? 
Like you're like, I got to do a lot of religious stuff now to get right. And you just add layers onto your already uh, anxious life. And so he says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you are, who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you relief. I will lighten your load. Right? Man, I, these are things I skip over so much. They're, they're mushy to me. And yet, in this season of my life, I've never learned it more. I, I'll, I, I think I've said this, but I'll confess a sin for you all, because it is a sin, and most of you probably sin this way. I was not practicing my Sabbath for about two and a half years, three years here. That might seem like, oh, not a big deal. It was huge. It led to a lot of anxiousness. It led to me not leaning on God and decision making. And, and, and so in practicing it, it's amazing that God was right. <laughs> I am sarcastically, right? Like, it seems dumb. Like, why should I spend a whole day focused on enjoyment? Like, that's a piece of it. To, to, to delight in God is what the scriptures say. To spend time with him and listen and not produce. Like, to not produce is so hard for me. It is so hard for me. I started writing uh, devotionals in my time with God on my Sabbath, and I ended up writing a devotional for a book. You know, like, it's hard for me to not produce. But in doing so, I'm producing more than I ever have by taking that day. He invites you to come and rest. There's a point where he is looking over a crowd. Jesus is looking over a crowd, and it says that he sees just all these poor people gathering around. And it says they looked helpless, and they look harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And it says that Jesus' heart filled with compassion for them, for these rejected, harassed, hurried people. They were burdened. That is who God is reaching out to. If you have come here with great anxieties, with great burdens, feeling the incredible weight of the world, I got to be a good mom, I got to be a good dad, I got to be great at work, I got to get good grades, I got to do more, I got to do more, I got to do some religious stuff now. He invites you to come and find rest with him. So you and I are living in a world whose sole trajectory is to say you need to achieve more, you need to be more, you need to earn more, you need to do more, you need to produce more if you want to have lasting value. And that is what we live in. Anything you watch, listen to, every work, everything we do is you are worthy by your production. But Jesus says, just come and be with me first. Sit at my feet. Martha and Mary, like we talked about four weeks ago. Yes, there will be a mission. Yes, he's going to give you a vision and a purpose and a vocation. It doesn't end there. But he says, just come and relieve your burdens with me. He says, I, I'm inviting you by name because I want you to be with me, not simply to do for me. I want to be with you, and I want you to be with me. Come and find rest. Eat with me. Pray with me. Rest with me. Exhale and let go in my presence. He says, you are laboring in this life. The word that is used for a heavy burden is actually a word he uses to talk about the Pharisees in a religious sense. And he says, you lay heavy burdens on people. And what he's saying is, you are so religious that you make life so hard for everybody else that you're like, you got to do this or you're not good. you got to do this. All you're doing is doing what the world does, which is you're not good enough until you produce more. And so Jesus uses that, that word heavy burden for a religious sense too. Maybe... It's expectations from the world. Maybe it's from your parents. Maybe it's in your work. Or maybe it's the religion you grew up in, which is also what the word meant, to have legalism and rules laid on you, and you just carry them, and you carry them, and you carry them. And so he says, what Jesus has says at this point to these Pharisees, he says, those religious hypocrites will load you up with rules to be perfect, and you'll never get there without me. Some come to me and I will, so come to me and I will lift those burdens for you. That's who Jesus invites in. Those who say, God, I need you to lift me up and take this from me. 
Did you come here with religious rules that were piled on you? Then Jesus says, come and be. Did you come here feeling the pressure of life, feeling like you can never be good enough or do enough? And Jesus says, come and find your real worth in trusting me with all that stuff. He invites you to come and rest and find relief. Another thing that is consistently seen throughout Scripture of who Jesus invites, it's about who, who Jesus invites to the table, who Jesus invites in to his life. He invites everyone, but a whole lot of people don't really want to go. Okay? He most often extends and invites those who are hungry and left out. He invites them to come and feast. Come and enjoy the blessing and, and me filling your hunger and your thirst and your desire for fulfillment and need and purpose. Come and enjoy it and get it from Jesus. Come feast on him. There's actually a point where he says, I am the bread. And what he's saying is, feast on me. Be with me. Take me in. Listen about everything I teach you. Sit with my words. Pray with me. Talk with me. Feast on me. Let it sit and savor in your mouth. Don't just brush it off on a Sunday afternoon. Jesus talks about the poor and those he invites in and the needy and the hungry. So often I actually didn't know where to start with this piece. There's so many verses. I'm like, that's like another 10 sermons. So I'm going to give you just a couple. In John 7, this is so intriguing. I need you to pay attention here because there's some history here. In John 7, Jesus is at a thing called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a party, y'all. It's awesome. They're feasting. But what the whole party was for was to celebrate and commemorate a time when Israel was slaves and poor wandering immigrants in a desert and God fed them manna from heaven and water from a rock. It was a reminder, we're going to celebrate and party because we want to remember that there was a time when we had no food, we had no water, and, got, and we were foreigners in a foreign land wandering through a desert with nothing to save us. And God gave us bread and water from a rock. And so Jesus stands up. They're all eating together, celebrating what God did in the desert. And this dude is crazy. He says, this is what he says. He goes, he stands up and he says, let anyone who is thirsty come and get a drink from me. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm that rock in the wilderness. I'm the place where you find salvation and fulfillment. Remember that you were the hungry. You were the immigrant. You were the one who was poor. And now for those who are hungry, those who are wandering, those who are sinful and lost, come and get a drink. Come feast. Later he says in Luke 6 that blessed are the hungry, those who are hungry now because you will be filled, you will be satisfied, I will be your feast. Blessed are the hungry for they will hunger after God's righteousness. Numerous parables talk about the feast. It's an important study if you ever want to get into it. It is an important thing because it is how God pictures what heaven should be like. It is a banquet where everyone is invited and enjoys the goodness of God so much that they're fulfilled and fully satisfied. So most notably, he tells us in one of these about feasts in Luke 14, he says that he invited all these people who were supposed to be his regular guests. They're like Christians who are too busy for God. They were re religious people. And he invites them to the table. And one says, I got to be with my wife. I got to do some labor. I got to do some work. I got some things that I can't, make your, I can't come and, and feast with you. These were the ones who were supposed to come, the good ones. So in Luke 14, verse 17, Jesus tells this parable. He says, so the master sent his servant out, and he says, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town, and I want you to bring in the poor, and I want you to bring, bring in the crippled and the blind and the lame. Go out and bring in those who would regularly not be invited and fill up this table. See, the well-to-do religious folk don't show up because they don't need them. They're not hungry. But oh, the hungry. The hungry are coming. Oh, those who...
those who are left out and discarded in society. They're the ones who come with the invitation. Oh, the wandering immigrant in the desert. They're the ones enjoying his shelter at his feast. Oh, the woman who is treated like trash because of her sexual history. She's the one following at his feet. Oh, the person who was told their whole lives that they would never amount to anything. They're the one ready for his new purpose and mission on their life. So Jesus says, that is who I invite. Those who are hungry and thirsty for the feast of my grace, my salvation, the love that I'm offering. That's who God wants to invite into this church. The scriptures say, don't just bring them in, bring them to the front. That's why my parents sit here. You take the most messed up people and put them right here. You're important. You're important. You're important. <laughs> Scripture says, don't, don't just have them sit in the back. No, bring them to the front. They are our guests of honor. Not the well-to-do. Not the religious nationalists who care more about their economics than the poor. You can sit in the back. No, those who are hungry are the ones who are most hungry for Jesus to say, come, enjoy me, be with me, rest with me. I give you a new vocation. They're ready to change. They're ready to drop their nets. Those in power, those people are too busy. Though, so if you're hungry for love, if you're hungry for forgiveness, if you're hungry for community, if you're hungry for healing, your name is on the invitation to the feast. You understand that? In the same chapter, in verse 12, he commands all who follow him to not simply invite people you're comfortable with or who agree with the way you see the world, but invite those who are completely opposite of you. Invite those that you're uncomfortable with. Invite those that you would disagree with, that don't see the world the way you see it. He says, you should be inviting the poor and the hungry and the left out to the table first. You should be looking for that if you're a disciple of Christ. Lastly, when Jesus invites his disciples, he invites them to come and have the trajectory of their whole life changed. He invites us to come and lead. He invites those who are looking for purpose and mission. Lead. The way we've talked about it, come and learn at my feet. Come and serve and engage the mission. Come and serve the needy. Serve people who are needing to be raised up in the faith, those who are hungry. Come advance the mission and disciple people and show them what I've shown you. Come and lead a ministry to help feed widows, to, to help nurture young people into, into faith and leadership. Whatever it might be, he invites you and says, I've grafted you in so that you have a unique mission based on who you are. And when you cling to that and do it and you make the sacrifice, because it is, guys, you're going to have to give up something to give God everything. Gee. There is a sacrifice, but it's not much of one because once you do it, you find out, man, this is what I was missing all along. This is what gives meaning to the spinning rock. Some of the first disciples he ever called were fishing on a boat, and he called out to them and he said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm giving you a job. You're good fishermen, but right now you smell like fish. I'm going to send you out and change how you do things. You're going to fish for people. You're going to go and bring others in to the kingdom of God and have them experience the power and grace and love of Christ. In our text today, he says to Simon, you are now Peter, as we talked about. You're the rock in which I will build my church on. Do you see it? He gives you a new trajectory, a new vocation, a new mission in life. The very meaning of our lives is changed when you accept an invitation to Jesus. He says, I have called you by name. You know my voice. 
Now follow me on this mission to the world that I have because where he's going, it's going to be a mess and it's going to be amazing. He's going in, into the religious and calling them out. He's going amongst those who are left out, the Samaritan woman, the poor, the leper, those who nobody would touch in society. It's going to be a scandal. And it's going to be amazing. He not only knows your name, he knows your gifts, he knows your story, and he is a calling on you to go out to the world and invite your family and invite the poor and the crippled and the lame to experience salvation and freedom in Christ. You guys know that? Evangelism is a dirty word today. It is for me. I hate the concept because it was always like, do you sin? Yes. You're going to hell. Like, that was evangelism. I think it's terrible. I never bought into that stuff. But call me to come and experience what God is doing in the world. Call me to experience love and graciousness when a world says, no, you're not good enough till you do more. Man, now I see. Show me. Come and see what you're doing on Skid Row. Now I see the goodness of God. It's not that I don't believe and what happens afterwards, it's just that's not what I'm going to set my trajectory of my life on. He's given me something so much more. He sends me on a mission. He wants me to come and invite people to come and feast. I'm going to ask you a question. If you've enjoyed the grace and the community of God and the grace of God and the love of God, if you've experienced your burdens lifted, how would you not want somebody else to come get some of that? Right? Right? Like, my life has been transformed. If I keep that to myself, I'm, a, I'm something. <laughs> Hashtag filter. <laughs> Multiple times Jesus uses, this is going to be incredibly important here, you guys. <laughs> Multiple times Jesus uses these four Examples as those he invites to the feast. Multiple times he says the blind, the cripple, the poor, and the lame. So first off, until you and I realize that we are hungry, wandering immigrants in this world, until you see yourself as those, we will never be satisfied with Jesus alone. If, you keep, if your first intention when I talked about the blind, the crippled, the poor, and the lame was to think about them people, you've missed it. That is you and I. That was you and I. That is often you and I. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Yes, if I don't remember, you know, one of the greatest sins of Israel is that they forgot what God had done when they had no nation, when they had no money, when they were completely rejecting him and wandering in a desert. And then they mistreated other immigrants and other people because they forgot. And so God condemned them for their lack of justice and for their lack of love of God. Until you and I realized that we were once hungry and were fed from a rock, and then when that sits within us, we will not go and run to the feast and sit with God. It will not be a major part of our lives. But if you've accepted the invitation to come and feast and come and lead, with Jesus, then you will be like the disciples and you will tell others, you got to come and see what God is doing. There is water from a rock. you got to come and see. There is salvation for those who are heavy burdened. you got to come and see. There is something greater than this Roman government that promises us everything and gives us nothing. you got to come and see the kingdom of God. So, the question I have to ask is we've got a mission here as believers that I hope that you are enthused to start living out and practicing, even if in the smallest way. One of the questions is, will you invite the blind to come and see? Who do you know who is looking for answers? Maybe that's you. Come and see. Come and ask. Come and wrestle with it. But do you know somebody looking for answers? Raise your hand. Anybody know people looking for answers, struggling with doubt, struggling with their faith? Don't just tell them because the Bible says so. Say, come and see and live a life worth, li worth being explored. Will you invite the crippled to come and be? 
those who are looking for relief. Who knows people who are incredibly anxious, physically having experiences of anxiety, depression, who are seeking relief in their life. Come on, that's a lie. That is the epidemic of our life right now. Who do you know that needs to be told, man, come and just be and find relief? There's this thing I'm a part of that's helping me lift these burdens. Come and introduce them to the Christ in you. Will you invite the poor to come and feast? Instead of having a strong opinion of who deserves your help, what if you just went and invited them to come alongside you? Might even change your life. Instead of filtering everything through your political party, what if you just invited people that were opposite of you to come in and see and experience and feast? You might experience the kingdom of God like you never have. Who are those who are hungry and thirsty around you and considered outcasts and off limits to those around you? Are you going to invite them to come and feast? Do you have the courage to do that? And will you invite the lame to come and lead? The lame to come find purpose. Those who feel like life is going nowhere. Anybody know anybody who you sit there and they just go, I don't know where I'm heading. I don't know what my point is. I just feel like I've been working for 30 years for what? Anybody? I'm looking for purpose. I'm looking for meeting. Are you inviting them in to come meet Jesus and experience the calling on their lives? Because that's what we believe as believers. If you're not one, this is what the belief of our Lord is, which is you were created and fashioned for that very purpose that is only found in Christ alone. You will only find what you were created for, which is what we're all looking for, when you sit and dwell with Christ at his feet. You have to come and see. It's remember the, the disciples. John says, go and be with Jesus. He says, come and see. And then they, Andrew runs away and he says, come. He goes to his family. Come and see what we're experiencing. He didn't say talk about it. He said be about it. If God is going to provide salvation and hope and relief to us, wouldn't we want everyone to come and feast? Unless God is just a fire escape plan for you. That's it. Like I just, I'm, I'm escaping some fear of judgment. But if it's, man, if you know what God has done in your life, wouldn't you want everyone you know in, to come and feast? In fact, God says you might even want your enemies to come and feast. If you sit here as a believer today, you are here because God invited you. Right? Maybe by a stirring in your heart. Maybe you were alone like me in a room. Maybe it was a friend or a family member who brought you. Maybe it was your parents. And that's okay. But God chose you by name. If Jesus invited you by name, will you go and do the same? If Jesus has called you out to relieve you, to love you, to serve you, to build you up, to strengthen you, to give you direction and purpose, will you invite others in to get that? This is not something we've done at this church before. We don't do one thing I actually am kind of proud of, but it, it, it's not like a rule or anything, but we just have never promoted or invited or been any, done anything with anything at this church for the last three and a half years to invite people in, really. It's just been word of mouth, and that's awesome. I mean, some of y'all are talking about what God is doing in your life, but we are going to begin asking and pushing you to invite people because one thing I'm convicted by is, how can we not? If God is doing a work in us, how can I not want everybody else to experience that? That is the call in our life as fishers of people. I'm going to invite you to do two things today. If you haven't come to the feast, if you're like, I'm not really a Christian, I have my doubts, I have my struggles, I am inviting you right now to begin to come and see. I'm not offering you instant change. I'm offering you to come and see and change your life's 
trajectory because he does the promises of God to be teased out by following him is that he will bring you relief, he will bring you salvation both here and in the hereafter, and that he will give you direction and purpose found only in him. Is there anybody who doesn't know Christ that way? I'm inviting you right now to raise your hand and come and see and begin that journey. Anybody? Okay, then we got some inviting to do. Amen? Number two, if you have tasted and seen the goodness of God, do not let anyone else miss out. Okay, and I got to tell you, man, my family has flourished by being in this community with you guys. Uh, my kids are flourishing. My wife's pretty awesome, but she was that before I got here. But it's been good. My family has flourished by being in community for the first time, really, in our lives. Um, so I'm inviting you. We're starting a new series. And it's called Scandal. If you haven't seen it, uh, we've been advertising it. But we're starting a new series, and we're going to walk through for the next six weeks all the way into Easter, the scandalous life of Jesus. To everybody around him, he was everything you're not supposed to be. And yet he was everything we need to be. Right? And what's interesting is you'll read through, the, as we read through the gospel, and we read about his life and what had happened on that cross it was a scandalous endeavor to everybody else. It wasn't scandalous to God, but to everybody else. He was called a lot of names and accused of a lot of things. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to invite people in, for people to see the countercultural cultural nature of our Jesus. That no matter what they've seen in American Christianity, Jesus is not a safe place to be cooped up. He is, he, it's a scandalous faith that has amazing power to it. It's exciting. It could be a TV show if you live it right. So what I'm asking you is outside is to grab this. On your notes, you'll see three blank lines. I'm asking you to pray first and then write down anybody that you know needs to be invited in, loved, lifted up, encouraged, supported, who's in doubt, who's in just free fall, anxiety, who just needs to hear who God calls in and invites and welcomes in. And I'm asking you to write down their names and then grab a few of those cards for however many names you write and go and invite somebody. You don't got to be a theologian to say, hey, come with me and see. Do you understand? Andrew didn't know all there was to know about, you know, Jesus and the history of God's people. But he knew enough to say, I've experienced something you got to come and see. You guys with me? I'm expecting huge things this year. I'm inviting you to grab the card. I'm inviting you to grab a few, however many you think you're going to give to somebody and be intentional in prayer about who you're going to invite to come with you. Don't just tell them to show up, sit with them. Amen? There's also, we've, got, we've printed posters for people to put up. If you have a business, you can grab them outside, put them up in your business. We want to, why would we want to keep what God is doing at Redeemers away from everybody else? Amen? This has been an amazing season, and I'm asking you to join in in what God is doing. And, and if you're like, I don't know what to invite people into, get involved. This is the end of our lead series. I hope that it's given you some direction. Wherever you are, start with inviting others. Start with sitting at his feet. Start with learning about God and what he's do, wanting to do in your life. If you're feeling like you're a Christian but walking aimlessly, what does God want to do with you now? What does he want to lead you in? How does he want to mess up your vocation to give you a vision of your future? Amen? If you'll stand with me. All right. <clears throat> Lord God, it is an incredible privilege to sit at your table, to feast. To not live in a world where more and more burdens are put on me, including in this religious world. To be free to follow, to be changed and redeemed by you, not by me. 
God, I pray right now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will speak to everybody here and in their own way of how reminding them of what you have done in their life, where you have met them, how you have invited them, how you have fed them. Lord, if there's anybody who doesn't feel like they're in that place right now, that is feeling like that you are distant, God, I pray that you will not only make yourself known and reveal yourself to them like you did to me, but that they will look and find you, that they will have eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, that you will convict them that, yes, they're asking questions, but they're not looking for answers. Because, God, not in a condemnation, but you want an invitation. You're trying to bring them in to eat with you, to find relief. So God, I'm praying right now for those and those who have been Christians for a long time and slumbering, they know, man, I have just felt laxed and empty and distant. God, I pray that you give them a vision of what you're wanting to do with them now, that you are doing a new thing in their lives, that you are constantly in the business of changing and transforming us in every stage. Lord God, we pray for every empty seat in this house, Lord, that you make us uncomfortable because of those who come in, both because there's too many bodies, but also because they're the people that we may not have invited in the past. They're the people we differ with. They're the people that we we don't understand. Lord, I pray that this becomes a place of mutual learning and growing together, that this is a place for everyone. Lord, will you transform us, change us, and give us a new mission and a new direction? Will you send us? God, I'm praying for your voice to be more clear than it ever has been for everyone in this room. And I pray that we'll have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, go get them, y'all.